Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Rajma Matani. I'm a medical oncologist at the University of Miami Sylvester Cancer Center, and I'm here to welcome you today to Cancer Care in the Time of COVID-19, a discussion regarding breast cancer and COVID-19. I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by two of my medical oncology colleagues. I'll ask you to introduce yourselves, Ina. Uh, Dr. Ina Segura, I'm a medical oncologist at Holy Cross Hospital in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, I spe subspecialized in uh, breast and GYN oncology. Great. And I'm Jane Mizell, also a medical oncologist. I'm at Emory University in Atlanta, um, and I subspecialize in breast and GYN medical oncology. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. So this has really been an unprecedented time uh, of change for all of us, both professionally and personally. And we hope that this program today will help you navigate some of those changes in terms of your treatment of breast cancer patients and also talk about a, a bit of the professional um, issues that we've had or, or challenges that we've had in this, in this unique time. So I'll start with the first question. How are you managing your patients with breast cancer during COVID-19? And Ina, I think these are your comments. I'll ask you to, to weigh in. So several weeks ago, uh, we started realizing that uh, we will likely need to start making modifications uh, due to uh, all the information that we were receiving from our medical colleagues in Europe. And in early March, uh, we were starting um, looking into the patients who were coming for regular routine follow-up visit for uh, surveillance of history of breast cancer and we started either rescheduling those patients or offering them uh, tele visits. Uh, fast forward as of last week we are now seeing almost all of our patients on uh, telemedicine portals. Uh, I do continue physically coming to the office and, and I cover some of the hospital consults and service. Uh, but most of our outpatient visits are now televisits. And then over the last two uh, weeks, we have started making significant modifications and changes in, in treatments. So, so initially it was um, kind of looking at uh, every six month injections. Um, uh, we started delaying them for a few weeks. And uh, at this point, we are looking into modifications in almost all of our treatments. Uh, we are um, kind of approaching it on an individual basis. Uh, in patients with metastatic cancer, we are trying to convert infusion to oral therapies when possible. In patients on adjuvant and uh, treatments, we are trying to kind of delay some of the uh, intervals. Uh, for example, Q21 days uh, regimens or, or dose dense regimens, we are changing to Q21 day regimens. Um, as in patients who have um, who are on age of um, HER2 uh, protocols uh, and they have completed six months of treatment, we are either postponing two months of treatment, delaying it, or if they are toward the um, completion of year of treatment, we are just um, uh, kind of canceling those last one or two infusions. So again, uh, it is really uh, done on individual basis at this time. You know, I'll ask you a question on the presentation, but one, one thing that I've struggled with and just the fluid uh, nature of this uh, issue, how are you keeping up with all of this information? What so I was actually, I was, uh, I started doing these modifications about 10 or um, 10 days ago or two weeks ago. And I was very happy when uh, the American Society of Breast Surgeons released new guidelines on March 24th. And those guidelines actually uh, really consolidated all of the changes uh, that I, I was making, although some of my colleagues were kind of um, not necessarily agreeing what I was doing. So, so these new guidelines have confirmed all of these changes that we started. Yeah, I think uh, as oncologists, we're very focused on evidence-based care. We don't have a lot of time to amass evidence in this situation, of course, but it's, it's good to see guidelines that are being issued for us to standardize these treatment approaches. Uh, Jane, I'll, I'll ask you to, for the for your answer to the same question. How are you managing your patients with breast cancer during COVID-19? Sure, I and mean, I think you know the individual. I mean, breast cancer decision making is always individualized, and there are always risks and benefits to consider. But I think COVID-19 and the you know potential risk of that for any patient coming into our infusion center is definitely another risk we have to consider now when we talk to patients about neoadjuvant therapy, about adjuvant therapy, um, or about neckline therapies. Disease. But a lot of therapies when possible. Um, we're doing a lot of neoadjuvant endocrine therapy now for those low-grade ER-positive tumors so that those patients can delay surgery. 
um, which is definitely new and different. Um, and, and sometimes you know, it can be really difficult for patients who assumed you know, they're going to the operating room next week and then they meet with me and they find out you know, we're starting tamoxifen. Um, but you know, patients too, I think are, they're so grateful at this time for the healthcare team being there. You know, we see that all across the country. I think we'll get to that some later as we reflect more about our personal lives and how this is all impacting us. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that patients, even those who you know, I, I used to think were more difficult or more rigid in their decision making, have been so willing to kind of go with me as I explain to them, here's what I'm thinking we should do now maybe to try to keep you out of the infusion center as much as possible while optimizing your treatment. So yeah. I think you know, staying organized has become more critical than ever. You know, looking at every schedule a week before, two weeks before to say who can come off this schedule and can be seen virtually versus who really actually needs an in-person visit, which is very few. Um, and then which infusions do we really have to do now versus can we delay? Um, and I think, you know, those have been the main thing. And I think just, you know, kind of learning more about telehealth and how to provide optimal telehealth experiences for our patients um, has been a really steep learning curve in the past week or so um, here at our infusion center as we roll that out. So yeah. I think, um, you know, staying flexible, trying not to panic, um, and then, you know, making sure that we're individualizing these decisions as much as we can for patients, um, you know, about what their risk from the cancer is versus the risk from COVID if we, if we delay or change anything about their cancer treatment. Sure. You know, it's, it's funny that you say that about patients being flexible and us being flexible. I think it's really taught me a lot about how much we can do outside of the office. And I think our experience going forward is really going to be informed uh, in the future by some of the decisions we've had to make. Um, so, so I think as we get further into the discussion, we're going to talk about positives uh, that we can get out of this. And, and I think that will definitely be a positive for me, learning how to yeah. prioritize treatment and with this new level of risk. So my, my answers are shown here. Um, they're, they're, really very much similar to what both of you have also mentioned or touched on, uh, rescheduling all routine screening, breast imaging. Now, I think for patients that get this information about their every six month or annual mammogram, whatever schedule they're on, uh, to get that call that your imaging has been rescheduled, it is creating a bit of anxiety. But of course, we're trying to emphasize that we're focusing on maintaining their safety and not coming to the office um, for these screening procedures, understanding that when the time comes to safely reschedule, those patients that have gotten off of their screening schedule will be prioritized. And we're also emphasizing that uh, although um, routine screening is, is being uh, delayed, symptomatic patients uh, or patients with palpable findings, patients that have had abnormal imaging and then need a biopsy, patients that have completed neoadjuvant therapy and need uh, imaging to, an ass to assess a response. All of that imaging is not being delayed and is proceeding um, as scheduled. And then elective procedures are being delayed. And again, you know, very, very often cancer-related surgeries are not considered elective, but we are looking at certain situations that I think, Jane, you brought up a patient with a clinical stage one ER positive for two negative breast cancer who may be offered hormonal therapy. And we know that that's going to not, um, not compromise their outcome in any way. Uh, and then in the situation where we truly have an elective surgical procedure like a prophylactic surgery or certain types of reconstructive procedures, those, uh, those are certainly being delayed. And then other high risk procedures are not being delayed. So things um, like an emergent incision and drainage and access, revision of an ischemic flap, those things would also uh, proceed as scheduled. Um, of course, you know, there are new concerns regarding balancing risk and benefit of treatment. We always struggle with this in oncology. All our treatments are individualized but it's introduced a new level of uh, risk into decision-making for all of us. So with that, we'll move on to the next question. What are your greatest concerns in standard care delivery outside of things like access to PPE? Ina. So I think my greatest concern for a while was that the healthcare institutions across the country are going to become a kind of a, really a sources where people will be um, getting infected. And I think this fear is somewhat alleviated now with wide implementation of telemedicine. So I think that that has helped tremendously. 
there's still many patients who do require to come in to the uh, infusion center and uh, who are on treatments uh, that potentially make them immunocompromised. So, so I'm kind of concerned that that population of patients is at increased risk. So, so also I'm hoping that the, um, once we have more uh, widespread testing available, that uh, that will improve tremendously as well. Great, thanks, Ina. Wow, uh, sure. So I think I, I, I think we I interpreted this question maybe slightly differently, and I was thinking more again about kind of the immediate concerns of our patients, and I think. One of my main concerns, and this also stems from being a breast oncologist, but also having just come off of a hospital rotation, is that the fear and anxiety that kind of surround all this is a big problem for people. Um, you know, cancer patients are afraid anyway, afraid of recurrence, afraid of progression, afraid of side effects, and then you add this COVID thing in there and it really heightens the fear and anxiety level. And I think the isolation that is necessary to protect society and that all of our patients are following, you know, really to a T and to protect themselves as well um, can also be very depressing. And so that lack of connection, um, that anxiety, not just about their cancer, but now about this potentially, you know, fatal communicable disease that's out there and is killing people um, is really, really hard for patients. So sort of managing social isolation, but also trying to help people work through that anxiety so they can see, you know, some of the brighter things in the day to day um, and allow them to function. Um, I think in the hospital rotation I just referenced, I spent a week uh, covering Emory's inpatient hospital service uh, the 19th through the 24th of March. And it was during that time that we had implemented our no visitors policy and seeing how that impacted patients with cancer who didn't have COVID, but who were making critical decisions often about end of life stuff in the hospital uh, with no one there, but with relatives on FaceTime, you know, it's just, it's a really different experience. And I think, you know, no family will ever forget that. And so the way that COVID is impacting the way we provide healthcare outside of the things we think of like PPE or, um, you know, the actual virus itself, um, these are going to be widespread implications. And then I think just access to clinical trials, you know, it's a little bit harder now to offer clinical trials emphatically when someone has access to a good standard of care, just because we don't want to subject them to any more interaction with the healthcare system than they have to. Um, and that's a good thing because we're protecting their safety. But I do worry a little bit about um, you know, research in cancer kind of falling by the wayside at this time and what that will do as we move forward. I, th I think that is a significant concern on our side as well. Uh, luckily, um, the sponsors have been really um, uh, trying to help and they allow us now to just do whatever we feel is the safest uh, process for the patient and just file the deviations. Yeah, we've, we've had the same experience and especially I've been um, pleasantly surprised to see a lot of the sponsors are allowing telemedicine visits uh, even in situations where usually the patient would have needed a physical exam, they're, they're very cognizant of the balancing act that we're trying to all play with uh, regards to risk and benefit. But putting patients on clinical trials often involves a lot of visits back and forth to the cancer center for scans, imaging, uh, diagnostic procedures, uh, EKGs, all of those things are now um, associated with significant risk of exposure. So it's been great to see that flexibility. Uh, my answers are, are quite similar to, to both of yours. I, I think this issue with anxiety, it's never a good time to hear that you have a cancer diagnosis. I, I really am very, um, my heart goes out to these patients with newly diagnosed uh, cancer during this horrible time because it's very difficult for them. They're worried about access to care. They're worried about access to having diagnostic procedures done, uh, getting the getting the testing, the workup they need done in a timely manner. They're worried about um, what their treatment plan is going to look like, uh, what type of risk that's going to so be associated with. So it's an extremely anxiety-provoking time for these individuals. And then on top of it, for those that are coming into the office, uh, we have that same policy of not allowing uh, any, any visitors in with them. So many of these patients, uh, we always talk about if a new cancer patient hears 10% of what you said during that first visit, that's actually good. We love it when we see friends or family in the room taking notes. That all needs to occur now remotely because they're not allowed to bring someone into the office and that's that's been a challenging issue again access to trials um, we've already touched on a lot of sponsors are putting trials on on hold 
Um, and, and again, I have the same concerns about where, where this is going to leave us on the other side, but of course we have to do uh, what's in the best interest of the patient. And then the patient's ability to come in for treatment, I think this ties in nicely to a lot of things that we're all struggling with. Um, we have children that, that are now at home and trying to balance childcare, uh, helping them with online school, and having someone uh, have someone uh, to, to come with them to the office visit. Uh, it, all of these things have entered into the decision making. Um, patients are having a really tough time. So I think these are our challenges. Um, and so since these challenges are not one size fit all, um, I'll ask you both to now talk uh, about what you're doing outside of the office. Um, personally, what are you doing differently? Nina? So I still continue covering hospital service every few weeks and uh, I live at home with two people who are either elderly or have high risk. So we have now completely separated our house to two parts, one where I live and the, and the part where my family lives. Um, I have done many modifications. I When I come home from work, I, I just completely um, go straight to the shower. I disinfect everything. I stopped wearing jewelry. I stopped wearing makeup. So many small things that we have done along the way. Mm -hmm. Jane, are you going through some of the same challenges? Yeah, it's definitely very interesting. So yeah, I started wearing you know, only clothes that I can wash at the hospital. Um, I've been actually showering my academic office. Interestingly, they have a shower here. So I have been showering here before I go home. Um, just because I find that it's easier to do that. So I bring a bag with like my clothes and if I'm a day when I'm seeing patients and having contact with people outside of my academic office, um, I'll just pop back over, take a shower, put on my clean clothes, and I've been putting everything into like a laundry bag in the office so that I then take home a week later and wash it all. Um, I don't know if it's actually helpful, but I feel like it probably is. It makes me feel less like I'm risking bringing that virus home to my family. Um, you know, it's interesting, the idea of like of isolation, because I think everybody has done this differently. My husband and I are both physicians, and we have two small boys who are five and seven. And since we've felt good, we have made the decision not to isolate ourselves from each other or from the children. Uh, we've sort of prepared our basement in case anyone does get sick, that uh, one person could self-isolate down there. So it's interesting. And then I think in clinic, um, one of the things that I've done is I've started doing only very targeted physical examinations for people who really need them. If I'm seeing a patient before chemotherapy, which, you know, obviously the clinic, the in-person clinic business has cut down quite a bit in the last two weeks. But the people I have seen, you know, often there are people who would request an exam just to like feel good about it, that I had done a breast exam, even though they didn't necessarily need one. Um, now I've been saying, if there's anything you need me to, you know, feel or touch, like let me wash my hands, put on some gloves and we'll do it. Um, but most patients are really fine without it. And so we have a conversation in person um, now with masks on um, and I see how they're doing and then they go down and they get their treatment and they get out of there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think these things will change over time in terms of what we're doing um, and not doing. Um, but I think all of us are just trying our best to do everything we can to stay safe, um, but not disrupt our family life or our patients' lives any more than we have to. Mm -hmm. And it's a balance. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been doing a lot of the same things that you both have discussed. Uh, it's funny because I had to rummage through my drawers and find an old set of scrubs that I hadn't pulled out since I was a resident. I was just happy that I had them. We actually had a mandate um, at our institution to, to not wear white lab coats any, any longer. The men are not wearing ties uh, to wear things that are easily washable scrubs if, if um, available. I've ordered a couple of new sets of scrubs. I'm also maintaining isolation, self-isolation. I've actually moved um, and I'm sleeping in the guest bedroom. I really am just very concerned about what I might be bringing home to my uh, family. And so I've uh, self-isolated at home. And I included telemedicine, even though we're talking about personal uh, challenges outside of the office, because uh, I've actually done quite a few telemedicine visits from home and had the opportunity to see patients in their home. So in a way, even though it sounds kind of odd, it's created a new familiarity with patients to see them in their own natural environment and, and 
in a way, uh, it, it's it's been sort of a positive. Uh, obviously, challenges uh, challenges in, in being able to examine patients and and patients' ability to get on to telemedicine. You know, I practice in South Florida. We have an elderly patient population, and some of them are quite technology challenged. So that's been that's been a tough one um, to do for the older patients. And let's move on to a discussion about managing life balance with these considerations like spouses working from home, children homeschooling, and shelter in place rules. I know I'm dealing with a lot of uh, um, signing up for time on the family computer and trying to figure out how to play things that I can work that's quiet and everyone has their own space. Uh, Ina, what are you what are you dealing with? So I have been very fortunate that my husband could. Uh, work from home and he really is kind of running the household and doing the homeschooling and doing everything else that uh, um, I wish I would I, I was able to do but it's just not a real reality right now um, so I'm fortunate I think in that way in that sense mm -hmm. how about you Jay um, so as I mentioned before, my husband and I are both physicians, so we both are continuing to work through this. But it's been interesting. I think the, um, the schedules that we have now for our breast group are block schedules where we're two weeks in person covering all the breast clinics and then two weeks virtual, doing all breast virtual clinics essentially, um, with the idea that we want to maintain depth within the subspecialty uh, so that if any one person gets sick, the other person is not exposed during that time. Um, and so my husband and I, have he has something similar in his pediatric surgery practice where they're taking calls and blocks and then working from home. So we're both, you know, kind of working from home with telemedicine stuff more than we would be. And we're trying to schedule our time so that one of us is there for a good chunk of the time. Um, and then, you know, I, it, this is not a work-life balance thing, but it works for me um, that I have been spending more time between the hours of 8 and 10.30 or so, um, catching up on notes, doing stuff that I otherwise would be doing during the day. Um, as an academic physician on my non-clinic days, I would usually be at work until, you know, a certain hour and then go home and make dinner and stuff like that. But now with the kids homeschooling, since I have the flexibility to do some of that work at night, I feel better about myself and just the balance that we've created. If I'm able to go home and, you know, do some reading or some math with my second grader, talk about how that journal entry or writing project went today um, and kind of be a part of that. Yeah. Um, and then my extended family has been amazing. So my parents and brother uh, live within a mile from us and we are socially distancing from them because we're the only ones working outside the home. And my parents are 69 and 72 and definitely I don't want to infect them if we have anything. Um, but my mom has been cooking for us every week and dropping off meals at our door. Um, my parents have been writing books, like little cute books for the boys, and dropping those off and trying to stay connected um, as they can. And then my brother and sister-in-law have insisted on doing all of our Instacart stuff so we don't have to spend the time clicking around and getting groceries delivered. That sounds so great. I think it's, it's been really for us to have them be so helpful and want to help us, you know, do healthcare right now. Right, right. So, you know, for me, one of the things that I've struggled with when I've tried to work from home is having a start and stop uh, of my day. The day blends into the night, blends into the weekends. And so I've really tried to structure my time where I have a start and stop time for work and for family time. This is the time I'm working. This is the time that I'm spending with the family. And uh, it's been challenging. Um, I am also trying very hard to uh, take my mind off of the current situation. Uh, it's very easy to put CNN or whatever news um, you're watching on in the background and constantly hear those updates that can be quite depressing and anxiety provoking. And I make a conscious effort to sometimes turn the information off, um, spend some family time, watch a movie, watch something else, just to kind of get my mind off of things so that I'm rejuvenated and refreshed. And actually, the other thing that I've really struggled a lot with is uh, exercise and not having access to the gym. Um, I love to ride my bike, so that's something that I've been able to continue to do. It's great to go out in the neighborhood and see all of the people that are taking their families on walks or bike rides and things of that sort. It's getting everybody outside, and I think um, that's definitely a, a, good, a good outcome, I would say. Um, what's the one positive thing, if you have to say one, that you're taking away from this crisis, um, Ina? 
So I, I think it's definitely solidarity among people. Uh, I have many colleagues that I went uh, uh, with to medical school back in Europe. So we have connected our social media. We are observing people um, kind of uh, cheering the first responders and uh, doing things for them. Um, just um, a few days ago, for example, our employees, as they were leaving the garage, they found a huge banner thanking them for their service. Uh, we have received letters from people who have, we have never met, encouraging us to continue and persevere in what we are doing. So I think that solidarity is, is what is kind of coming as a really positive thing during this crisis. Mm -hmm. I agree. Jane? Yeah, I think um, I would definitely agree with that. I, I put as my third bullet point of being re-inspired by my profession. And I think it is, you know, patients are grateful, society is grateful, and we're all grateful to be here. I mean, it's it, it feels like we are, you know, even more so than typically um, involved in something much bigger than ourselves. And it does feel like a gift to be able to provide the services we provide in this crisis. Um, and then I would say the other positive thing is more of a family thing, just that I think, you know, in the pre-COVID era, it was so easy to have our whole weekend just like pass by in a flash of t-ball games and practices and birthday parties and play dates and nights out with our friends, babysitters. And now there's none of that. And so it's just family time and it's actually been amazing. Um, and so I think that is one of those things that I hope to sort of bring forward into our hopefully post COVID lives, um, just to take that time and not to overschedule and, and really just enjoy the gift of being together. Yeah, so that, that was the essence of what I chose as my one positive time, time to reflect. Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. It's really been an experience for me to recognize the, the truth in this statement and recognize all of the times that I, uh, in routine life, was kind of missing out on small moments that are really what life is made up of. And just having that time where we all uh, have the same schedule for once, we're all sitting down and having a family meal together, just spending time talking about how we're all able to get through this together and having that family time has been amazing for me and also time to reflect uh, on my professional goals as well. So it's, it's been, um, you know, in a way a positive, obviously uh, we, we wish that it didn't come to this um, for us to learn some of these lessons. I'm hoping to take uh, something positive out of it um, post COVID as well. So what's something important to you right now, Ina? So I think educating the public. We live uh, in South Florida and this uh, region, this area is dependent on the service industry. So there is a huge economic impact on most many people who live in this area right now. And it is very difficult to kind of educate and convince the public that staying home is the best thing that they can do to help the healthcare providers manage this uh, crisis that we all found ourselves in. So I think um, AMA, um, American Medical Association, has um, sent a, a great open letter to the American public um, that could emphasize this point and, and educate the public. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say also, um, there are many concerns on social media about economic impact of, of the crisis. And uh, many, many, even some of my colleagues are questioning if um, kind of the cure is worth uh, is, is worse than the disease. Um, so I think that we still have a, a long way to go to educate the public about the importance of staying home and stopping the spread of infection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jane? Yeah, no, I, I've seen it in our smaller um, kind of in the, inside the perimeter Atlanta community that most people seem to be taking social distancing seriously. Um, and, but I think continue to re-educate people on what that actually means, how actually much they have to distance themselves is really key. Um, I think, you know, staying safe for me, staying safe for my patients, um, keeping everyone safe is also critical. Um, and then from a professional standpoint, I think you know, this has made me realize again, just how much patient care really is so central to everything we, we do. I mean, yes, research is so important. Teaching is so important. How can I incorporate that within the context of you know trying to take optimal care of people in the midst of this public health crisis? Um, so, like you said, Reshma, I think um, you know thinking myself about those personal and professional goals has been really key. Um, but in terms of the big take-home points, I think you know to get through this, we have to make those sacrifices as a society in terms of social distancing and those kinds of things. 
um, you know, I think it's important not to distance yourself to the point where you are disconnected. Um, in many cases, I've found like, you know, doing Zoom calls with my med school friends who I haven't talked to for three years because we're all in different parts of the country doing different things has been amazing. And so using this period of, you know, physical social isolation to try to remain more virtually connected um, has been a positive and something else I'm hoping to take away. I actually, it's interestingly, this uh, term social distancing, I think I have socialized more in the last two weeks than I, than I did in, in the last year of my life. I think it's really physical distancing and um, social, socially we are increasing our connections and communications. Yeah, yeah. good point. Good point. So I, I uh, put one, uh, one of my goals again was keeping patients and myself safe. We're all um, very worried about safety in this era. Um, I think as physicians, our friends, our family, our patients are looking, up, looking to us to be educators here. Uh, and it's important that we all have information that's accurate and we're being very vocal about the importance of social distancing and educating the community on how to flatten the curve and recognizing that we know that ultimately a certain percentage of patients will get infected, but we're just just trying to get to the point where we're not overwhelming our resources to the point where, where um, patients are not getting access to care because of healthcare systems being overwhelmed. So I think our, our entire community is looking to us as physicians to be educators. And so this is uh, very important to me. And it's also important uh, to me to stay connected with patients through telemedicine and recognizing that uh, all of these adjustments that we've had to make into the way we deliver care uh, are, are, is, is being done with the intention to still provide the best care and optimize uh, patient outcomes given the circumstances. So what are a few COVID-19 takeaways that you'd like others to know? We are at the point where we are really truly considering this very serious and uh, we are factoring this uh, risk of, of patients with cancer uh, being infecting uh, and possibly dying from the infection into every, every really decision that we make at this time. Um, data for, from China suggests that uh, mortality of patients with underlying uh, malignancy could be as high as 8 to 10 percent and a um, risk of kind of severe complications in uh, those people who are infected and have underlying malignancies reported to be more than 50%. So I think that we are balancing this risk in our treatment decisions and um, it's, it should be done on the individual basis, but now we have some guidelines to kind of guide us on, in those decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the things for patients to know, at least, you know, here in Georgia so far, um, for patients on curative or life-prolonged therapy for breast cancer, I've been telling them, as is the case, that your treatment should continue um, without your treatment being altered unless we're making a decision together based on risks and benefits that it should be altered. Um, and so having those conversations to reassure people that we're not going to just let their cancer fall by the wayside because of COVID. Um, and also that we're trying to do everything we can to keep people safe. You know, there have been a lot of people writing in to say, you know, what is happening at Emory? How are you maintaining safety in the infusion centers? Um, and really trying to keep people informed of all the measures we are taking to make sure that people stay safe here. Um, and then I already kind of alluded to this before, but I think it's exactly as you said, that um, physical distancing is really what this is about. It's not necessarily social distancing. Um, you know, maintaining those connections with friends, with family, um, sometimes reconnecting with people we haven't talked to in a while um, can be what it allows um, and prioritizing mental health and all that. that's also been very important as we use this is not something I think that's going away in a month um, or maybe even two months this is something we're going to be dealing with in 2020 um, mm -hmm. so figuring out how to pace ourselves for this marathon as opposed to a sprint will be very important as a society uh, so you know the takeaways that I listed um, included that for, for early stage patients where we know breaks in their treatment are really possible to, uh, breaks in their treatment could uh, be associated with impairing their outcomes. We're very committed to making sure these patients are being treated as scheduled. And uh, in the metastatic setting, when patients are on treatments that prolong their lives and are helping manage symptoms, all of these decisions are being individualized. But I agree with you, Jane, we're trying to reassure patients that we're not just cutting off treatment. Obviously, these patients are very 
dependent on these therapies. And I think in oncology, especially in breast oncology, we've um, been fortunate that of late there's been a shift towards oral oncology medications. And that's been um, a very fortunate in this situation because many of these patients can be safely managed at home while still on their cancer treatment because a lot of the drugs have become oral. Uh, again, you know, getting that message out about ways to protect yourself, washing hands, uh, not shaking hands, uh, the six feet social distancing, which again, I, I agree is more of a physical distancing. And then the important part about this term social distancing, it doesn't have to mean social isolation, right? We're really fortunate in this era to have so many platforms where we can stay connected, Zoom, uh, Skype, uh, face, uh, FaceTime. So we should make sure that patients recognize that now more than ever, uh, we're there for them. And even if it, if it can't be a touch uh, on the shoulder or a handhold or a hug, which we all miss giving our patients, and uh, at least if we have that connection um, virtually, that that still uh, is maintaining some good degree of support for them. Uh, so with that, I'll ask you both if you have any parting words, any last comments you'd like to make. No, I'd just like to thank everybody uh, who organized this for getting us involved. I think it was a really nice opportunity to reflect on what we're doing for our patients and how we're handling all this ourselves. Um, and also great to talk with both of you. Um, and I would just say to everybody, stay safe out there, stay physically distanced and, um, and be good to yourselves. Mm -hmm. Ina, any last words? Stay safe and stay home yeah. whenever you can. You know, the funny thing is we're all signing off uh, in our own ways now that is some, some iteration of stay safe or wash your hands or stay home. So I think um, you know, that, that's, that's been interesting to see as well. So uh, with that, we'll end the program and I hope it's been informative for all of you. Take care. Take care.